You're listening to episode 44 of Liz's Healthy Table. Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great, too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the podcast, everyone, and Happy New Year. I am not going to talk about New Year's resolutions on today's podcast, but in a few weeks, I will tackle New Year's resolutions. I'm going to share some of your resolutions. I'm going to share my resolutions, and I'm also going to dig into some hot new food trends for 2019. So you'll definitely want to check out that show. But in the meantime, today's show is a conversation with Hungry Girl. She is a foodie who's always hungry, and for well over a decade, Lisa Lillian has been sharing her love of healthy food through her Hungry Girl platform. Lisa makes smart eating easier with her daily email, which is filled with recipes and diet hacks and nutritious food finds. She writes cookbooks. She has published 12 of them to date. She's got a magazine that you can find on newsstands right now. And she has a weekly podcast. So on this week's show, Lisa takes us behind the scenes to Hungry Land, where we're going to dish about her most recent cookbook. It's called Clean and Hungry Obsessed. We'll talk about the most popular recipes on her website, diet and food trends, which certainly changed over the years. And we'll give you a sneak peek at her next cookbook, Lucky 13. For my U.S. listeners, we are giving away a copy of Clean and Hungry Obsessed. So head on over to lizeshealthytable.com slash podcast. Navigate your way over to the show notes from podcast 44, and then scroll down to the bottom of the show notes page, and then you can enter to win that way just by simply posting a comment and telling me why you want to win Lisa's book, or you could tell me about your favorite Hungry Girl recipe that you've made. So U.S. listeners, head on over for a chance to win. Liz's Healthy Table is brought to you by my friends at superhealthykids.com, your one-stop shop for recipes, meal plans, cooking videos, and tips for feeding kids of all ages. And my show is also brought to you by the Parents on Demand Network. It's an app filled with parenting podcasts, including my podcast, and a show that I just got into recently called Pure Nurture. This is a podcast for new moms and moms-to-be, and they have holistic health experts on the show, and they talk about all sorts of things, including an episode I just listened to on the microbiome and your baby's lifelong immunity. They also talk about mindful eating for the whole family. So check out Pure Nurture and many more parenting podcasts at parentsondemand.com. Lisa, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. So I don't even really know where to begin with you because there's just so much to share. But for my listeners who may not be familiar with Hungry Girl, can you just tell everybody like what your platform and your brand is all about? Sure. So I started Hungry Girl back in 2004, which is a long time ago. Started as a daily email service. This was back before social media, before blogs, before blogging. I was just a person who loved food. I'm a big food gossip. I'm a total foodie. I don't have any medical degrees. I'm not a nutrition professional. I'm just hungry. And I had an idea to start a brand called Hungry Girl that could help regular people, everyday women and men, make small choices. So that's how the brand launched, and it started as a daily email. I still send those daily emails Monday through Friday, and out of the success of those emails has come a lot of other exciting content in the form of books, and I have a podcast and a Hungry Girl magazine. So the whole idea is to help people make smarter food choices and to make eating easier for people. Why do you think that this daily newsletter 
launched into so many other things. Like, why do you think it resonated? Like, why did your message at that time resonate? Because like you said, there was no blogs. There might have been maybe a vacuum of information. But what do you think it was that just made it sort of take off? I mean, it was just like, whoa, Hungry Girl, you're everywhere. So what was the magic? I think part of it is that I was really the first one to do that. Like there was not a lot of competition. And of course, not to take anything away from the content, I think at the end of the day, content is king. And if you have content that's entertaining and informative and compelling and resonates with a large audience, people are going to want to share that. So everything spread really quickly via word of mouth. I've never spent any money to market the brand. And out of the success of those emails, everything else just sort of fell into place. It's unbelievable. And I think also you sort of set up this community of people, you know, back then, again, there was a little bit of a vacuum. And suddenly you had this online community. And I would imagine the people who started following you in 2002 or four, you said, are probably still with you. Tell me about that community. A lot of people are. And I would say the audience is extremely loyal. And they found that the content was really helpful. You know, I started just with giving tips and tricks and survival techniques and food finds. It wasn't even about recipes back then, but I really listened to the audience and I love, you know, having that rapport with them and just grew the brand accordingly. And it's been great to have so many people say that they've been reading and being helped by the Hungry Girl recipes and Hungry Girl content for so many years. Actually, earlier today, I have your book, Hungry Girl, Clean and Hungry Obsessed. And the book is like right up my alley because it's all like the recipes you love, but made healthier. And I made your Mexilicious spaghetti squash casserole. And I'm like totally on a obsessive compulsive jag right now with winter squash. I actually had a podcast on it a few weeks ago and I love this recipe and I haven't eaten it yet because you know, when you make a recipe, well, I took a tiny bite. You want to take photos and it drives my husband crazy. He's like, can we just sit down and eat dinner, please? But I love that recipe. Tell me a little bit about this book. It's your 12th book, I believe, right? Yes, this is book number 12. It's been out for a while now, but the last two books, the one before this one was called Clean and Hungry. This is Clean and Hungry Obsessed. So those last two books focus only on using all natural and clean ingredients lots of lean meats, lots of fresh fruits and veggies, lots and lots of using produce in place of starchy carbs, like in the case of this recipe. And I love this book because I really set out to recreate everything that people want to eat, be it burgers, pizza, french fries, spaghetti pie, in ways that you can do it, you know, with a fraction of the calories and eat big portions. I am all about big portions and smaller calorie counts. You want to get a lot of bang for your calorie buck. So that's your name, Hungry Girl. So if you're hungry all the time, then you want to make sure that every calorie kind of counts, right? Like it's not wasted. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, like, even when I first started, I was always thinking about, well, how can I eat more food? It's like, I'm not the kind of person that wants to only have a small bite of this or a tiny little piece of that. I am a volume eater and my goal is always to create things that taste delicious and things that can allow me to eat more of it. So I want to just go back in time again, and then we're going to get a little bit more into the book. And I want to talk more about that recipe. But many years ago, this is like 1987 to 1992, I worked at CNN in Atlanta. And when we got on the phone earlier, before the interview started, I just want my listeners to know, Lisa said, do you live in Atlanta? I'm like, oh my gosh, no, I left Atlanta years ago. So I worked at CNN back in the 90s. And I met this guy named Robert Davis, who was a medical producer, and I was a nutrition producer. So we were on the same team. And Robert and I became very good friends. And then we ended up working together years after both of us left CNN. But it turns out that Robert is best friends, Lisa, with your husband. And so you and I are one degree of separation. That's why I've sort of followed you all these years, because Robert always talks about you. But let's give Robert a shout out, because you love Robert. I mean, he's like your BFF, and he's written a bunch of books. So tell everybody a little bit about Robert. So Robert is also known as the healthy skeptic. He is my go-to sort of professional when I need someone to like give me the skinny, no pun intended, on whether or not this is true or that's true. He's a really great, you know, myth buster. Um, He's a very close friend. He and my husband have been best friends since they're five years old. They grew up in Memphis, Tennessee together. 
And Robert was actually one of two best men at my wedding. So wow. we do go way, way back. And he's also one of the nicest and smartest and most level-headed human beings I've ever <laughs> met in my life. I love that guy. So in the show notes, I'll give everybody links to Robert's books. He has a book called The Health, the Healthy Skeptic. And it is important to cut through the clutter and when it comes to health information. And so, yeah, so there you go. Shout out to Robert. But let's get back. Let's get back to Hungry Girl. And let's get back to kind of your, your philosophy and, and, and what you love to share with people. So talk about how things were back in 2004 and how things are now in terms of like food trends, because I can't even believe how the interest in nutrition has just blown up over the last 10, 20 years. So what changes have you seen? What have been some of those big, big food trend changes and health trend changes? Well, Hungry Girl, I like to like ride the food wave of trends. I don't necessarily predict the trends, but when I first started, Everyone was avoiding carbs. There were low-carb stores on every corner. Um, people thought carbs were the enemy. A lot of people were using a lot of processed foods, including me. I mean, I, a lot of my recipes used to use things like fat-free Cool Whip and sugar-free Jello. Back then, that's what, what everyone was doing. Well, over the past 15 years, those trends have really changed. People have started reading labels. They care more about ingredients and what they're putting into their bodies. Um, I just see there's always going to be some kind of a fad diet and everybody always wants to latch on to something that they consider the enemy. Um, I think my philosophy is a little bit more realistic. I, I, th I believe everything in moderation and I do believe that calories do count. I know that it's not necessarily the trendy way to think of things now, but at the end of the day, calories are important. So I like to think of the Hungry Girl philosophy as as very reasonable and realistic and doable. Because if you're going to say something is the enemy and cut it out of your life forever, whether it's sugar or carbs, I, I don't know that that's the most realistic approach. I feel like the best way to approach eating is to figure out what your trigger foods are and what foods work for you and which foods make you feel the best and can help you on your journey and then stick with those rather than to try to latch onto something that's m more of a magic bullet. And I feel like there are so many magic bullets nowadays, right? There's paleo, there's vegan. I mean, it's, it feels it's gluten free. You know, you feel like there's so many, so many things going on. And, and, and I'd agree with you on the whole carb thing. People were so freaked about carbs and now, you know, beans have carbs and, and, you know, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of bean pastas instead of flour pastas, but I'm cool with that because you're getting more protein, more fiber. Maybe it's more satisfying. So I think people just want to feel satisfied. They want the food to taste good. Yeah, they want the food to taste good, but um, I do think that they're very, very eager to find something that they can call the enemy and avoid that. And it's not as simple as that. Being very, very extreme is difficult to do in the long run. You're better off just figuring out how you can find things that you can eat forever. That's just not too extreme. I think that's why probably the spiralized uh, vegetable trend really took off and, and continues to be really popular. And I know in Obsessed, you've got I think it was a tuna noodle casserole, right? That you make with with uh, zucchini noodles. I thought that was really clever. I yes. love that. Well, thank you. I mean, there's definitely a lot of using vegetables instead of carbs, like cauliflower rice or zucchini noodles, spaghetti squash noodles, carrot noodles. You know, I do try to replicate the flavors of like very starchy, carby Mexican and Italian food or Chinese food using vegetables. It's easy to do if you, if you just use the right spices and the right sauces, you can make vegetables taste like anything. Mm -hmm. So let me talk a little bit about that recipe for the Mexalicious spaghetti squash casserole. And it was so easy because I just roasted two, I found these really cute small spaghetti squash. So I just roasted two small spaghetti squash. And then when they were done, I cut them in half, scooped out all the seeds, and then I kind of shredded it up. And I had the five cups of the spaghetti squash that you call for in the recipe. And then I sauteed up a pound of very lean ground beef with a lot of spices. So it was like a chili powder and cumin, paprika, garlic powder, onion powder, and salt, and some veggies. There was onion and bell pepper. And then I added that in with the squash, along with two cups of crushed tomatoes, 
and an egg. I actually, you call for egg whites. I used an egg because that's just how I roll. I just throw the egg. And then I baked it. You put it in an eight by eight and then you bake it and then you top it with shredded cheese, low fat cheese and sliced olives. And my house smells so good right now. And I love that recipe. So I cannot wait to have it for dinner. And what's been like the feedback? Like you must hear from your community all the time. Like, are there certain recipes in your book that kind of jump out? I mean, that one, when I went through the book, I was actually at the doctor's office and you know how you have to sit in the waiting room forever. And I was like, so happy to wait because I just kept going through the book. And that was the recipe that just kind of grabbed my attention, maybe because it's winter. You're making me so hungry, first of all. (laughs) Yeah. So what's been the feedback? Like, Which recipes in the book have really resonated with people? And then we must talk about chocolate because you do seem like you really love chocolate too. Well, I think that a lot of the recipes resonate in the book. People love meatloaf. So the meatloaf recipes really are very popular, as are all the veggie noodle recipes, the cauliflower rice recipes. They love fries. So all the veggie fry recipes are popular. We do get a lot of feedback. I hear all the time from fans about their favorite recipes or things that they make over and over. I wish there was a way of knowing, like when you sell a book, how many times each recipe was made. I wish it could be like that obvious, like somehow that it was on the back end. We could keep track of that. Sadly, Mm. there's not. No, I know. (laughs) What about just Hungry Girl in general? I mean, I get your newsletter, so it's just chock full, like you said, of information and content, and you always get recipes. Has there been a recipe over the years that has been the number one most popular? I would say there are two. I mean, one is so simple. They're both so simple, it's silly, but I think that's why they're so popular. One are the Yum Yum Brownie Muffins, and those are basically just cake mix and pumpkin two ingredients and it's so, so easy, but it never gets old and it always tastes amazing. And also the egg mugs. So like back in the day, I just, I'm pretty lazy when it comes to making things and cooking in general. And so I decided to start making my morning egg scrambles in a mug. And I don't think people realized how easy or that even that was possible. And so I hear most often that their lives have been changed because they didn't think they had time for breakfast or a hot breakfast or a healthy breakfast. And they just throw egg beaters or eggs or egg whites in a mug with either laughing cow cheese or some vegetables. And you have like an instant scramble. So easy. How long do you cook that in the microwave? Probably a total of two and a half to three minutes. And you stop halfway and you stir in between and until they're all cooked. Mm. It's pretty amazing. So easy. You just want to make sure that your mug is microwave safe because sometimes they're not. So you just want to make sure, right? Because I am constantly, very true. I reheat my coffee at least a hundred times every morning in the microwave. So every now and then I grab a mug and I'm like, what, what is up with this mug? You know, it's like it got too hot. So that would be my only caveat. So the eggs in a mug and the cake with the pumpkin puree. I actually years ago remember going to Trader Joe's. I used to do this, again, obsessively. I would get the triple chocolate brownie mix at Trader Joe's, and then I would add some pureed pumpkin instead of, you know, the stick of butter. And maybe I'd throw an egg in there. But that pumpkin, you never really knew it was there, but it was a good fat substitute. And of course, it adds good nutrition, a little bit of fiber. Why not, right? It's perfect. I mean, it's just magical. I mean, you know, you just have to watch out for people who accidentally buy the pumpkin pie filling. That's Mm. a mistake. It's easy to confuse the two and that stuff is loaded with sugar, but just pureed pumpkin is a fantastic MVP in my kitchen. Mm. Always, always has been and will be. So what does it look like? Like if we went behind the scenes at Hungry World, like what does your world look like? Because I know you have a staff of people. Are you guys cooking all day? Like take us behind the scenes. Sure. So our headquarters are in the Los Angeles area that I call it Hungry Land. And it's a really fun place to work. There's a test kitchen. We are developing recipes every day. There are about 10 of us that work here full time. All the content is created here. So everything from Hungry Girl magazine articles are written here. All the recipes are developed here. Usually all the books are shot. All the photos for the books are shot here in our studio. The Facebook lives, the videos are shot here. And it's a very cute colorful, energetic space. And it's awesome. I love when people visit us. If you ever come out to LA, please visit us. I will because I saw, I think it was on, was it Facebook? I think you had Joy Bauer, who's also been on my show. You had Joy Bauer at Hungry Land. And I think she was doing a podcast with you and she had laryngitis from what I can remember. 
Exactly. She was here. We did a Facebook live to promote her book and she is terrific and she could barely speak. I felt so, so sad for her. But <laughs> luckily, because I've been fighting a cold, she left her Ricola here and I've just ate the entire bag for the past two weeks. So okay. that was the only good thing that came out of, the, out of her having a cold. <laughs> well, you should not have a cold, but you know, hey, it is winter, but you live in LA. See, I think people out in California never get sick because it's always warm out there. In my mind, it's always beautiful and warm and sunny. Maybe not though. Yeah. I mean, the weather today is actually raining. It's pouring. And usually I don't get a cold. I travel so much. I always like pride myself on saying, oh, I travel so much. I have a great immune system, but I was out of the country and something got me. Mm. My husband's sick as well. Like, so we've been fighting this cold. Boo-hoo. No fun, but you sound okay. So what's next for you? You know, what's book 13? Any sneak peek into book 13? Sure. Yeah. Book 13 will be out in early March and it's called Hungry Girl Simply Six. And the concept behind that is that it's six main ingredients or fewer in each recipe. Again, everything's all natural, but six ingredients. I mean, that's what the audience really wants. Everybody has just been saying, make it easier for me. Make it, you know, so simple that I don't need to have a whole laundry list of ingredients. So that book really delivers and I'm very excited about it. I can't wait to see that, you know, and I'm kind of with your community on that one, just keeping it simple. And it's interesting because I actually did Blue Apron and some of those other meal kits for a while, and it was supposed to make my life simple. But I actually found that it was very complicated because the recipes were fabulous, but there were so many ingredients and you still had to prep them. And I was like, it was making me crazy. I don't know if you've ever tried any of those. (laughs) Maybe you need to have your own line of those or something. Yeah, that would be fun, actually. Mm -hmm. I have a good friend in New York City who definitely gets them delivered, and he does a lot of them, Home Chef and Blue Apron, and I help him make some recipes. The thing that I noticed is that I want to eat the whole thing, even if it's like two or three or four servings, I want to eat all of it. But I like those meal kits. I think they're fun, and they let you experiment with ingredients that you may not have tried before. And that's the thing I like the best about them. Right. And then you because they might send you a small little vial, you know, with some kind of interesting, Mm -hmm. you know, fish sauce or something in it. So yes, and I actually think they're really great if you have kids at home, especially teenagers, because that really gets them excited because they can pick the recipes ahead of time. And then it comes so cute, right? It's very appealing when you get this box delivered, the, you know, the big unboxing, and then the kids or the teenagers can actually make dinner. And I have some friends who have two teenage girls, and they have totally gotten into cooking because of Blue Apron or, you know, whichever meal kit they're using. So they definitely have their benefits, but I do love the idea of the six ingredients. I will be grabbing that book for sure. So talk about dessert, because a lot of people think if you're eating healthy, whether it's for weight loss or heart health or whatever it might be, whatever your goals might be, that dessert has to be off limits, especially chocolate. So where does chocolate fit into your life? You know, I know that people are obsessed with chocolate. I like chocolate. I would not say I'm a chocoholic, but over the years I've experimented so much because of the demand and I know how easy it is to create healthy chocolate desserts. I make brownies out of black beans. As I said, I take the chocolate cake mix and add pumpkin to it. I use a lot of cocoa powder. I think it's very, very easy to create decadent chocolate desserts for a fraction of the calories of what you'd find when you go to restaurants. So I love experimenting. I'm like a mad scientist Mm -hmm. in the kitchen. And you do, in your Obsessed book, you do have an overnight oats recipe that calls for cocoa powder. And that really caught my eye. I think there was there mashed banana in that maybe. There was walnuts and that looked really good. So good. First of all, I love overnight oats. I love oatmeal. I love growing oatmeal. And there are so many ways to experiment with it. And using cocoa powder and oatmeal and having oatmeal that tastes a little bit like dessert is it's really satisfying. I love it. So are you in the kitchen making recipes and creating? Are you working with your team? Where do you fit into all that that wild world of recipe development? Well, I try to do it all. Our world recipes are developed on paper first, like we'll brainstorm and we have ideas and they're on paper and they go back and forth until they're ready to go into the kitchen. And then they go into the kitchen and we have a team that helps put those, you know, into play. So we take that recipe that was developed on paper, it goes into the kitchen and then I taste everything and tweak it along the way. So I'm involved every step. But every single day, day in and day out, there are recipes being made in the kitchen, whether I'm making them or whether the team is making them. 
it's just so much fun. Everyone's like, how do you eat food all day, every day? And keeping your weight in check is a challenge when you do that. But I'm always up for that challenge. Well, one of the things you talked about on one of your recent podcasts was house walking and getting more movement and more exercise into your day. And I was thinking of this. I was talking to my mom on the phone last night. I'm like, all right, don't sit on the couch and talk to your mom. Walk around the house when you're talking. So what's house walking? House walking is something I actually discovered it a few years ago after I went to high tea at a hotel in Chicago and I was feeling like, oh my gosh, I must have eaten 2000 calories. And I started walking around my hotel room. And I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I walked around the lobby at first, then I was walking around the hotel room. And I'm like, I'm getting all these extra steps. And then when I got home from that trip, I said, I'm going to just start walking around the house while I'm doing things like brushing my teeth, or while I'm on the phone with my parents or doing whatever I can do answering emails on my phone. And it's just a great way to rack up a lot of extra steps. I try to get it, you know, 10 to 15,000 steps a day. And house walking really helps with that. I love that. And because this show is running, it's my first show of 2019. I think house walking could be a New Year's resolution that everybody can easily jump on to. Speaking of 2019, any other like tips you might have? I mean, we've talked about using veggies in our cooking a lot more. We're talking about, you know, making smart, healthy swaps. But just when you think about the new year and starting fresh and being healthier, what sage advice can you give my listeners? I think that people tend to start off the new year with good intentions. And then there's some statistic like by week two of January, a lot of people have given up those goals. And part of the reason there is that people are a little bit too extreme and they're hard on themselves. So they feel like if they're not perfect, then they just throw in the towel. And I think the best advice that I could give is to take one day at a time. You can take one meal at a time, but don't throw in the towel and you don't have to be perfect. And you know, I come from a family where my mom was always dieting and she would say, I'm starting my diet on Monday or I'm starting my diet on the first of the month. And that mentality is what throws people off. So early January, it could be January 2nd or 3rd or 4th. If you feel like you've messed up, don't throw in the towel. Just stay on track. And, you know, as far as that relationship with food, too, and it sounds like, you know, you've evolved over the years, just that it's all about kind of real food and just enjoying your food, right? I mean, and making a few little tweaks and swaps, it doesn't have to be anything, you know, extreme at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, for me, I always tell people to pay attention to the foods that really satisfy them and foods that they love to eat. And it's not about like looking at a list on paper or following some kind of a diet to a T. It's really about finding things that you find satisfying that you feel like eating a lot all the time. You know, those foods become the tools that can help you really achieve your weight loss and maintenance goals. And Lisa, just to wrap it up, where can people find you other than your books, which you know, you're going to find in any bookstore, just remind everybody about the magazine and the newsletter and where can people find you out in the world? So the hub for all things Hungry Girl is hungry-girl.com. If you go there, you can sign up for the daily emails, which I definitely recommend. You can see where to listen and how to listen to the podcasts on that site as well. We also have a big Facebook community It's facebook.com slash hungry girl. There's an actual community where the fans connect with each other and also just a lot of interesting social media posts. The magazines are on newsstands right now. There's a new one out. It should be like at your local market or at Whole Foods or Target or Walmart. So that's at the checkout counter. And on Instagram as well, I'm at hungry girl. So you're everywhere so people can find you. Good stuff. I should be easily, easily located. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we'll be looking for the new magazine for sure. Is that quarterly, by the way? Well, it's not on any set schedule. This is the third issue. So there's one out right now. And I'm not exactly sure when the next one will be out. But hopefully, I think in a perfect world, it would eventually be quarterly. But now we're sort of testing the waters and seeing how it goes. So people can find you everywhere. And I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. And we'll definitely be on the lookout for book 13, Lucky 13 in March. So thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. I'm really a fan of what you do. So thank you so much. 
Well, it's been a pleasure, and I hope everybody will head on over to com slash podcast. This week's episode, the show notes will be packed with all sorts of links. We'll share this recipe we talked about from Lisa's book, Obsessed. And for my U.S. listeners, you can enter for a chance to win. If you love the show, post a review on iTunes or Stitcher Radio or wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table and Happy New Year. 